Uh, so there's an example. And what, what now remains to be done is the, this is the critical step. We have to find the exponential parts. And, uh, and this is not so easy. So that's like before we had to find the degree or the denominator. Now, uh, now it's getting interesting. We have to find the, the ex possible exponential parts for the hyper-exponential solutions of, uh, of a given differential equation. And at this point, I have to cheat a bit. So until now, everything was self-contained, uh, I hope. Uh, but now I have to tell you something which I have to ask you to believe me. Um, the first fact, so there are two facts. The first fact is there is a way to compute local solutions of a given uh, differential equation. Now what is a local solution? A local solution uh, is, in, in calculus lectures, it's usually a power series. So you can say there, there is a way uh, of expressing the, uh, the solution of a differential equation in this form where, well, that's an infinite sum, but it means being able to compute it means you can get as many coefficients as you like, as soon as you have given the differential equation. Now, uh, not every differential equation can be solved in general in this, in this form. In general, you have to get to uh, some more complicated series. So in, in general, you have uh, not a power series, but something else. Uh, in front, some factor x to the alpha. The alpha is some uh, funny constant, maybe square root of two, um, and uh, and then times the power series. And even that's not enough. Even even that's not enough. In general, you have something like uh, x of uh, one over x uh, in front, um, where instead of that you, you may have a, a, a polynomial in one over x if you have an, an essential singularity there. So, uh, and it may be even that there's a rational uh, exponent there. So, so that's a, that's a pretty complicated uh, a type of, of, of generalized series. Or there may be also logarithms, but we don't need the logarithms. So, so here's, uh, here's that one what I described here. So you, you say you can always find a series solution. So these are the series, this is the series part. I multiply it by some uh, funny power x minus psi, if it's not at zero, uh, times uh, an exponential of uh, a polynomial divided by x minus uh, uh, psi to the d, and p is, uh, p is a polynomial of degree less than d. So there's a way of finding it. I could explain it if you want it, but I don't, I don't have the time. So it's not really difficult, but it requires a few minutes to explain it. So just believe me that there's a way of doing this. Here, here's an example for the uh, for the equation that I showed on two slides ago. So it has two solutions. One looks like this, and one looks like this. And uh, that's the first fact. Oh yeah, and uh, there's, another, uh, there's another set of solutions. It depends on which you, what you choose as expansion point. If you expand at, at two, you get these two solutions. With this and this exponential part. Okay, so here's the other fact. Um, if you if you look at the uh, at the exponential parts of a hyper exponential solution, then these exponential parts can always be written as a combination of the exponential parts that you see here in these series expansions. Uh, I show you an example what that means. So here here we have for the ODE or example we have four candidates. Um, this 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 and this. And it, it's obtained by taking uh, uh, the, the two uh, exponential parts that we got from expanding at one. These are those two. They appear here and here. And combine them with the two exponential parts that we got from expanding at two, which are uh, those two and those two. And then all combinations give you, so here, this, this is, this is the, uh, expanding at one, has this uh, candidate and this candidate. And expanding at 2 has this candidate and this candidate. And all combinations together gives you some uh, x of a funny rational function. And all these, well, are way too many, but it can be shown that they include the, the two ones, that the, one, the exponential parts that we are after. So what we do in the algorithm is we compute the series solution by an algorithm that I didn't explain, but I claimed it's easy to do. Uh, and then we get we get these pieces. That's the only thing. In fact, these pieces. That's the only thing we are interested in. 
and then we combine them for all the for all the uh, the singular points. That means all the roots of, of the of the leading coefficient of the differential equation. And then here's what we do. So you you uh, you find the singularities. The singularities I didn't say I think. Uh, they are the roots of the leading coefficient of the highest order of the polynomial in front of the highest order derivative. Uh, so th these are some finitely many. For each of them, you compute uh, such a series solution so that this here is written at xi equals zero, but in general it's x minus xi. Uh, and then that means for each of them, you get a set of exponential parts. So for, for each of them, you can get some exponential parts, several, possibly, uh, that belong to this, uh, to this location, psi i. And then you go through all possible combinations. So for, for each root, uh, psi i, you loop through all these exponential parts here, and here for the second, and, and so on. And that, that goes through all the possible exponential parts that can occur in the solution. And for each of them, you do what I expect before. You make an ansatz for an unknown rational function with this exponential part, uh, construct an auxiliary equation for this rational function, solve it by the algorithm we explained and I explained in the second part, uh, and then for each such rational function solution, you output uh, u times e, this e here, as a hyper-exponential solution, and when this comes to an end, you can be sure that you have enumerated all the uh, hyper-exponential solutions uh, of the given differential equation. And if that doesn't find any, it proves there is none. So here's an illustration. Uh, let me try to explain what that means and let me try to remember what it means. Yeah, it's Usually it's unknown if you take a random differential equation. Uh, it's not uh, unknown. No, it's there's usually no, there's, it's, there's no there's, solution. There's, solution. Right, there's so usually there's no solution. So it's probability 99.999% that no solution. So all these examples, that's artificial. Yeah, you right. start with a solution, you cook up, and you have a paper and a talk. But it's a big waste of time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you're still offended. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm offending. <laughs> so here, here look, at, look at this picture. Um, so that, that's supposed to illustrate the combination problem. We have to go through all, com uh, all exponential parts, all local exponential parts. This is. Uh, a row, so for, for each singular, part, so these the, the rows are the singularities of the equation. In this case, here are four, and for each singularity, we have a number of exponential parts. This one has three different ones. Uh, this one has four, uh, and so on. And what this algorithm from the previous slide does it, is it goes through them all. It, so it, it goes through all the combinations, and they are really a lot. So uh, if you have an order r equation. You may have up to r different exponential parts in each row. And then if you have n singularities, so that this is usually a big number, then you have to go through r to the n candidates. So that, that's finite. But, but it, it's just finite. <laughs> so it's, it's not really finite. It's, it's uh, well, OK, and this is now where our contribution starts. So together with my uh, student, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, sorry, with uh, Frederick Johansson and uh, collaborator Mark Messerova. Uh, we have done this year for Isaac an improvement of an algorithm. So we gave, we gave a new algorithm, I will explain it in a minute, it's not so hard, uh, which uh, very quickly finds the relevant co uh, combinations without going just stupidly for all possibilities. Um, so uh, it, will, it will produce a list which contains at most R candidates instead of this huge number. And it will uh, need only a polynomial number of arithmetic operations to produce this list. So, so this is really something that you don't see every day. I don't, I don't know why they don't show this on TV, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the reduction of exponential time algorithm to something like this is, is not something that happens every day. Um, and it's, it's, so it's a, it's a kind of a dynamic programming algorithm. Um, I, I'll explain it with this picture. So remember what that meant? Uh, we have here, I said, for each singularity, uh, the, the uh, local exponential parts uh, are represented by these bullets, by these dots. And uh, uh, there may be several solutions with the same exponential parts. So I ask you now to imagine that each dot is the vector space of all the solutions, series solutions, that have the same exponential part. 
uh, and here are the ones with the other one, and so on. So, so this is really a vector space, possibly of uh, uh, some dimension. So it contains all the series solutions expanded at this root of the, uh, of the leading coefficient, and uh, having sharing all the same local exponential part. And here you have the same thing, uh, except at another root, another singularity. Uh, it's also a vector space, and we also have higher dimension. And now I ask you to imagine what what is this uh, what is this edge? Under which circumstances can this edge be a part of a uh, of a combination that is relevant to the algorithm? Now, if there is if there is a hyperexponential solution which uh, corresponds to some path through this diagram which contains this edge, um, then that means this this hyperexponential solution it must live in this. Uh, vector space because if you ex it, yeah because if you expand it at sky one it cannot be there and there because it has this exponential part locally there and also here it must be there because if you expand it at this point it has this exponential part and not this so what that tells us is this edge can only occur in a, in a valid combination if the intersection of these two vector spaces is non-empty right. Oh, where did I lose you? Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. So th this is the critical observation. This this uh, this edge can only be part of a solution of a valid combination if the intersection of the corresponding vector spaces is not empty. Okay, and then we can prove that's a lemma, a, a miracle, if you want. If you go through all the R square combinations of two. Uh, uh, singular points, then uh, it's only at most r times non-empty. So uh, we, we don't care about this first, we only combine two of them, uh, so there are r square uh, intersections of vector spaces that we have to calculate, and then we have to ask how many of them, which of them are empty, those we can discard, and which of them are non-empty, those we have to keep, because they potentially belong to a valid tuple. And, well, it turns out that at most R of them can survive, uh, and that means we, we throw away a lot of stuff that afterwards will consume a lot of time when we still have to combine them with other things. So, uh, here we have now vector spaces. This is now the vector space that contains all the local solutions, no, all, all the, if you want, global solutions that have uh, uh, a reasonable exponential part at psi 1 and a reasonable exponential part at psi 2 and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a solution which has this there and this there and there may be several but not more than r and then we keep on doing this so we do it now again there are r square combinations of this partial uh, tuples with the next exponential parts and again there can be only r, at most r of them which can survive so if you keep doing this then uh, this is much, uh, there's much less work than if you go through all the combinations. Um, the, the, the problem with this is, is it's just that it doesn't work. It's easy, to, it's easy to draw a picture and maybe it's convincing, but you can't do this because what, what, are, what are we really... So I, I said we have to intersect two vector space, but, but what, what is living in this vector space are uh, things that, that you cannot compare. Uh, so it, uh, here... I have one. So here's an example. So you have some local solutions at uh, at x1, uh, at, at xi is equal to 1. So, so these are formal uh, series objects, if you like, uh, expanded at x equals 1. This also. So you can consider the vector space generated by those two. You can also consider the vector space for of all formal series solutions uh, expanded at x equals 2. But there's, there's no meaning to intersecting these two vector spaces because they don't live in a common ambient space. So this is like uh, you, you, this, you can view uh, x minus 1 as, as, uh, as y and x minus 2 as c, so that it's, it's different variables. They have nothing to do with each other. Uh, and this is the point where the, where the second offense happens uh, because now we use uh, complex analysis. <laughs> yeah. So now we release. I kept on saying throughout the talk to make uh, to make it more uh, 
more dramatic. I kept on saying that we, we view everything formal and algebraic and so so in a formal sense there's no there's no meaning to intersect these vector spaces. But now if you think of this as analysis, then you can say, okay, uh, view this formal object as uh, the analytic function, uh, complex analytic function which has this series as asymptotic expansion when when z goes when x goes to one. So you may have something like uh, uh, this is x equals 1, and here this is x equals 2. These are the ones which live there. And then, uh, so these, these, lo these, these local series expansions, you can view them as, uh, as asymptotic expansions of actual functions that live in, in, in sectors. So usually you may expect maybe a ball, but these are essential singularities, and then in that case it's just sectors. So we have here a sector and there a sector, and then you can do uh, analytic continuation of all these funny functions to a common point. So maybe to here. So you, you can write this and this and this and this uh, and, and change the expansion point, maybe to zero. And then you have something that you can compare. So uh, here you have power series in x and here you have also power series in x and then there, there's, a, there's a meaning to saying what the intersection should be. So uh, this is again uh, easy to draw uh, on, on a blackboard, but not so easy to do. So what, what we really need here is an algorithm that has been developed only a few years ago by Joris van der Hoven, um, and, and we are exploiting this. He, so he says, if you give me the initial data in an essential singularity, and you give me an, an other point, x0, and you give me an epsilon, then uh, oh, well, a rational function, then, uh, sorry, a rational number, then he's able to compute uh, an approximation of the value of these analytic functions that are uh, uh, defined here and there to a precision which is guaranteed to be less than epsilon. So even though it's numeric, uh, it, it's still symbolic because it's a guarantee. You have a guaranteed error bound, and this this is not. I mean, you shouldn't think of floating point arithmetic algebra fixed position. But this is really, uh, if we want this to be ten to the minus ten thousand, then we get this accuracy, and we get it even efficiently. So, and the true the true value, uh, the true value, uh, the complex number. Uh, which is the true value of the function, is guaranteed to be in the ball of the output value uh, uh, so, so of, of this, uh, the ball of radius epsilon around the output value, which is the rational function. Um, and, and that's all I want to say about uh, finding hyper-exponential uh, functions. I want to conclude with, uh, because I know there are people in the room who don't believe in the existence of uh, complex numbers, so I want to conclude with a, a remark of, of Einstein, who, who once had a visitor who was surprised that he had a, a horseshoe in his, uh, in his office. And you know, horseshoes, they are supposed to, to give luck. And the visitor asked Einstein, oh, you're not really believing in this, right? And Einstein said, no, of course I don't believe in it. But they say it works nevertheless. <laughs> but it wasn't Einstein, it was Niels Bohr. Oh, really? OK, I know it for Einstein. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Thank you for this awkward talk. Any questions? Yeah, thank you.